Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Tom Gibbons. I work for our Associate Provost, Jay Hickey. And on behalf of our current Stockdale Chair, Dr. Pauline shanks Carn, who's listening, I'd like to welcome you to our, the first in a series of Leadership and Ethics Lews that we're doing. Um, before we start, though, special thanks to Laura Cavallaro from the Electives Office, who's making this loop possible. We really appreciate all your support, Laura. So thank you very much. Um, it's my honor to welcome Dr. George Lucas. Uh, George is going to talk about his new book, Ethics and Military Strategy in the 21st Century, Moving Beyond Clausewitz. George is a good friend of mine. We taught together for a year when he was at the Naval War College. But a little bit about George's background. He's a professor emeritus at both the Naval Academy and the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, he's also served as the James Stockdale Chair of Ethics while working at the Naval War College and teaching Foundations of Moral Obligation with me for a year a few years ago. Uh, George has worked at several civilian institutions in addition to the Naval Academy and the Naval Postgraduate School. He's written several books. Um, and, and again, this is the first in a series of lose that we're doing related to leadership and ethics. Um, in a minute, I'll turn it over to George. But if anybody has questions at all during George's presentation, feel free to use the chat function and we'll record those and, and ask the questions at the end. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to my friend, George Lucas. Thank you, Tom, and thank you all for joining us today and for allowing me to be with you. Uh, I usually follow on an introduction like that by um, remarking, as my late mother used to say, this is my son who can't hold a steady job. Um, <laughs> but uh, that was my one claim to fame, as the one Tom mentioned, I guess, if it is a claim at all, is that I had the privilege of, I call it hitting for the cycle, uh, teaching as a senior and tenured faculty member at, uh, well, all three Navy senior educational institutions, the, uh, the um, Naval Academy, the postgraduate school, and the War College. And of the two of those, the first two who have tenure, earning tenure, and also the honor, it's rather odd, being appointed emeritus professor by the administration uh, after retiring at both places. So uh, I guess the relevant thing though is retired. So he's out of the classroom and out of the way and <laughs> we can move on. Um, I myself have been moving on in retirement to try and gather thoughts together um, about the kinds of things all of us, uh, Professor Karen, uh, Dr. Gibbons, uh, Dr. Demi, um, so many of us have been doing over the years teaching ethics and leadership uh, in a military context at military institutions to uh, army officers enlisted to, uh, um, to Navy personnel, to Marines, uh, to Coasty, Coast Guard uh, uh, personnel. And that's been a great honor uh, over my career to be involved in doing that for something like 25 years before I retired. And this book that Tom mentioned, uh, Ethics and Military Strategy in the 21st Century, as the old dude who's uh, uh, gradually turning senile and going out the door, it was my attempt to uh, gather together some of the changes that have occurred over, uh, certainly over my career, uh, and really in the last just couple of decades in the way military personnel are educated, the way they're prepared to fight wars, fight the nation's wars, what those wars are about, how they're conducted, and so forth and so on. Um, so that we can do an effective job in military uh, and professional education, including ethics education and leadership education. Um, the subtitle of this book is what I want to start with uh, because it's deliberately provocative, moving beyond Clausewitz. Well, um, or the short nickname is just Beyond Clausewitz, the original title I wanted to give the book. And of course, that suggests uh, here we go, another guy is coming to write an obituary for the great Carl von Clausewitz, the uh, classical, the formulator of classical war doctrine, um, modern war doctrine, um, that's held sway for almost two centuries now. And those obituaries come and go from time to time, and the people who write them come and go, and Clausewitz remains. <laughs> so it's a formidable task. And I'll say right off the bat that that's not what I want to do, is uh, I neither want to praise Clausewitz nor bury him. Instead, I would like to do something different, which is to 
absorb him or assimilate him into this new context of war fighting and military education that we work with now. Uh, before I do that, it's worth saying a word or two about the way in which Clausewitz himself transformed th the thinking at the time in the early 19th century about war. He himself, as you all will probably know, since he's such a, a famous symbol to military personnel, particularly Army and Marine Corps land-based uh, um, garrison forces, but um, to, to everybody, you I mean, this is anybody who wears a uniform and serves their country, uh, uh, the defense of their country, knows something, certainly has heard the name, uh, and knows some of the famous principles of Clausewitz. And as I say, it's very hard to think about moving beyond those because Clausewitz himself brought his experience as, um, uh, as an infantry officer in the or infantry infantrymen in the Prussian army, fighting in the Napoleonic Wars, and then um, serving um, um, as the uh, head of the uh, Prussian military academy, uh, a job he held until his death, uh, and the posthumous publication of his book on war. So you all know about that story and know that he was an experienced. Um, a uh, person on the battlefield, as well as a tactician and a strategist, and teaching those um, so influentially at his institution. Uh, and in the process, developing um, what we now recognize as the first sort of modern theoretical foundation for understanding the nature of warfare. Prior to Clausewitz, it was, you know, war is a sport of kings or War is a scourge, theologically speaking, on uh, fallen and sinful human beings uh, condemned to constantly uh, live in uh, quarrels and fighting and uh, the misery that causes and suffering and destruction and death. Um, or it's all about national honor. Um, we can't let those guys on the other side, our adversaries, our enemies, um, um, uh, dominate us or um, beat us or defeat us. So there are all kinds of, of unsystematic theories, but being a good German, Clausewitz comes along and like a uh, German scientist or German philosopher, sits down and thinks the whole thing through from the foundations um, and establishes the idea that warfare is none of those things exclusively which has been associated um, it's not a matter of manliness and honor or the sport of kings or any of those other things so much as it's a political act. It has political causes. It serves political purposes. And the main thing is it represents a situation where whatever the political goals and aspirations of a country and its leadership may have been, if they have failed to attain those to a satisfactory degree, they have to resort to the use of deadly force to compel their adversaries to their point of view. And so it's the famous politics, uh, the continuation of politics by other means or by non-political means. So you might say Clausewitz did for warfare what Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton did for classical dynamics and physics, put it all, unified it all, systematized it all, brought it together in a grand synthetic synoptic vision uh, with a firm, scientific, analytical foundation uh, that, that could then be studied and taught and practiced in the battlefield, um, as physics was then uh, systematically gathered all of its dimensions, astronomy and mechanics and what have you all uh, in a single unified um, science under Newton, uh, under Newton's three laws. And in fact, Clausewitz himself isn't just the equivalent or analog of Newton in the element of warfare. He is himself steeped in Newtonianism. And those of you who have made the closer study of Clausewitz in the course of your military education will know that he makes extensive use of Newtonian uh, concepts, uh, physical concepts in talking about war. Um, they're metaphors, they're not precise, but they're very much more analytically exact than anything that they replaced. 
So we talk about armies as forces uh, or as vectors exerting forces on the political equivalent of centers of gravity. They may be national capitals or they may be national policies or they may be boundaries or national boundaries or whatever that you're trying to change, move, reconfigure in some sense. And you use force to move those things literally almost physically around until the arrangement suits the more powerful um, of the militaries involved. And so we have the metaphors that, uh, that we associate with Clausewitz, not just the famous politics by non-political means, but uh, forces, vectors, political centers of gravity, the fog of war, all these kinds of, of concepts that we associate more or less symbolically with Clausewitz. And so how, in what sense would we move beyond those? In what sense would um, those need to be replaced in the contemporary era, if at all? Um, and so my proposal is not that we abandon Clausewitz or that we ignore or refu repudiate, but then instead we absorb and assimilate Clausewitz in the same way we had to do with Newton in the aftermath of relativity and quantum mechanics in the 20th century. So with the advent of hybrid warfare, war in the gray zone, um, professional militaries about which Clausewitz himself wrote a great deal, that ours had been historically a volunteer and or conscripted army. Um, and now we think about all of these new forms of warfare. One of the chapters in my book, uh, is entitled, This is Not Your Father's War, after that famous old um, Oldsmobile commercial, you know, the car commercial that said, this is not your father's uh, old car, this is a sporty new type thing. Well, unfortunately, warfare is definitely different and sportier in certain ways and elusive and um, problematic in, in many respects. And we might wonder, I think it would be the right way to put this, to what extent do those classical concepts of Clausewitzian war, conventional war, carry over into this new frame of reference? Just like we ask how much of Newton carries over into relativity and quantum mechanics, the answer is a great deal. There are principles that don't change at all. Newton's second law and the principle of war as uh, politics by other means, for example, probably carry right over unchanged. They're what the physicists would call covariant principles or principles that are not changed or abandoned under a transformation or frame of reference. Um, but there are other things that do change. Maybe they don't go away, but they change their relationship to each other. In physics, you remember, it's uh, time and distance and um, continuity and all those kinds of things get a real um, shaking down when we move into quantum mechanics or into um, the physics of the very small or relativity, the physics of the very large. And I'd say the same thing happens again, metaphorically, allegorically, uh, metaphorically, I'm sorry, in, uh, in warfare when we carry our contemporary experiences of hybrid war and irregular warfare and terrorism, counterterrorism and counterinsurgency and cyber warfare and um, drone warfare and whatever it may, robotics and artificial intelligence and all these kinds of things in the gray zone as the Pentagon likes to call it, uh, including what I prefer to call soft war, the war without um, or unarmed uh, conflict, uh, war without armed conflict, like cyber war. Um, all of those kinds of things challenge our conventional notions of forces and vectors and centers of gravity. Um, and in particular, then the thing I focus on as the title of my book suggests is a thing that was on the outskirts, the outside, the edge, the periphery of classical warfare, namely ethics and morality ends up at the center of everything in this new frame of reference. Um, pause parenthetically to say that I just learned to my amazement and delight that the superintendent of the Naval Academy, our new superintendent, um, Admiral Sean Buck, 
I haven't met him myself yet. I just know of him and learned the other day that he had asked to leave at least part-time, leave the administration building where the soup has always sat since, <laughs> certainly since I got there and probably from time immemorial in what's now known as the Larson Administrative Building. He wanted to move out of there, not full-time, but a couple of days a week and establish a satellite office across the yard in the Stockdale Center. As a matter of fact, I was honored to find out he's gonna be in my old office that I abandoned when I retired. And uh, he's got a nameplate and a desk over there. And uh, sir, why I wrote to him just this weekend. I said, sir, why are you doing this? I mean, it's, it's a great morale booster for the people at the center and the, my old colleagues in leadership, ethics and law and so forth who will feel they're more at the center of things if you're there with them. But what uh, led you to do it? And he said, well, this is the center. Um, it's at the edge, it's at the periphery. But what you do over here, particularly in military ethics, I believe, says the new soup, um, I believe this to be the center uh, and the heart of the Naval Academy and uh, the Naval Academy's mission, indeed the Navy and uh, the Naval Services um, national and international mission. And I wanna be a part of it. I wanna learn more about it. I want to develop my own capacity uh, as, as a leader uh, and uh, a thinker and a, um, in, in the course of doing that. So I'm making the shift uh, a couple of days a week. Well, good for him. And that's, I think, a post Clausewitzian <laughs> shift. It's the sort of thing I'm suggesting that it's impossible to take this stuff too seriously. Um, and that change of perspective is very different from the perspective of Clausewitz himself, uh, who was a, a very well, not only in Newton, but also in philosophers like Immanuel Kant in particular, German philosophers like that are difficult to read, just like Clausewitz is. Uh, he, he was very knowledgeable, but he did not believe that what we customarily think of as ethics, you know, nice people and benevolent feelings and kindness and gentleness and truth telling and what have you, belonged on the battlefield because it would just get in the way of doing your job. It would discourage and dishearten you and perhaps lead to inefficiencies that would actually uh, uh, paradoxically lead to a, a, a enhancing or a magnification of the time spent in war and the suffering inflicted by war. Ethics, he famously said, has no place on the battlefield. Well, now we say it's at the center of what we're doing on the battlefield. And having said that, we've certainly, you know, then done some kind of a relativistic transformation of classical conventional warfare uh, and its relationship to, to conventional morality into this new frame of reference that we're working on now. And the rest of my book tries to flesh out exactly how that works, both with cases and with uh, discussions of concepts. Um, and I'll mention a couple, and that'll probably take me another, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes, and then I'd love to shut up and listen to what you think about all this, because I, I will say and address what I think might be skepticism on the part of some, when they hear this, say, well, yeah, we know how important, you're never going to find anybody who doesn't say that ethics and military ethics are important. But the saying and the doing are not necessarily the same thing. And the paying of lip service, which most senior leadership is willing to do. And if you ask, they will say, oh, yes, I can't imagine anything more important. But they won't do what our superintendent's doing. They won't put it at the center of their own lives or their uh, command philosophy uh, um, or commander's intent in quite the same way. They'll think that we should talk to the chaplain about ethics, or we should talk to the JAG about ethics. And those are good people to consult. Those are, uh, we have some of those people here at the lecture today. <laughs> um, but uh, I keep telling them as often the chaplains and the lawyers do, you know, sir or ma'am, the chaplain is not the uh, moral advisor to the command and the JAG is the legal advisor, not the moral advisor, and can only give you advice on what you can and can't do. 
he or she and the law and status of forces agreements and so forth can merely state what is tolerable behavior. They can't solve moral dilemmas that you'll encounter on the battlefield and you will encounter them all the time. It's the commanding officer who is the moral advisor to command. And if you believe that in this new framework, that in turn calls for something that I discuss in the book, which is a very different philosophy of general professional military education than heretofore. We don't just focus on strategy and tactics and equipment and technology and um, politics and international relations. We do do all those things, but we also have to understand moral reasoning, moral principles. We need to know the limits of the law so that we can challenge the JAG with the right questions. Don't just tell me what I can get away with doing. Um, just tell me how the law works and whether it addresses the concern I have that we're involved in something that maybe we shouldn't be doing or that we'll regret having done and give me the wisdom to understand when that is. So in the book, there are stories of people who did that, who had that wisdom, who had that courage and strength that goes beyond just simply uh, following the rules or being obedient, which is very important, but not the only thing. Um, by the by, advertisement, Speaking of military obedience, its limits and its uh, problematic parameters, uh, my colleague, Professor Curran, is a um, wonderful book on military obedience with the Naval Institute Press that discusses these ambiguities. You should look at that. And uh, the, the, again, it's one of these concepts that we think is just tried and true and we know exactly how it works. And uh, yes, sir. Uh, um, the commanding officer said it, I believe it, that settles it and so forth. Uh, it's not quite that simple. Uh, and there are all kinds of ambiguities and nuances and dilemmas that one faces in the context of obedience in the military that are addressed in that wonderful book and uh, uh, seek her out, seek it out and uh, uh, examine this. Okay, end of that sidebar and commercial and back to the point that there are all these people whom both she and I talk about uh, in different ways in our respective books who are exemplars of this kind of thing. One famous one, of course, is uh, much discussed and very controversial, SEAL Team 10, <sighs> starting with the fact that it, as all of you special ops people know, it wasn't SEAL Team 10, there was another team by another number, but we even have a statue and a memorial to the, the four uh, uh, members of that particular um, SEAL team who were engaged in the famous uh, tragic uh, altercation in, uh, in Afghanistan in 2005, uh, captured by the Lone Survivors uh, book describing it, uh, Petty Officer Marcus Luttrell, uh, Lone Survivor in 2007. And the talk you'll find, or rather the chapter you'll find about this in my book was actually be began its life uh, right then in 2007 as an address to the cadet wing at the Air Force Academy about what were the new challenges that they would be facing in leadership and ethics in this transformed environment. And um, all these events, I mean, I think the, like the weekend before I gave that talk initially, the um, folks at Penn State at the football game had, had paused to pay tribute to uh, uh, Lieutenant Michael Murph, Murphy, uh, who had just been awarded or conf had, had conferred upon him the Medal of Honor posthumously um, for his decision making and leadership in that context. And there was, you know, skepticism and cynicism about that. Is that face saving? Uh, did he really deserve it? And my argument was, yes, he did, because he intuitively reasoned his way and led his, his men, including uh, Petty Officer um, Luttrell, to the right decision at a terrible, terrible cost. But I raised questions about what would have happened had they done otherwise. And whether it would have turned out the way Murphy, himself, I'm sorry, the way um, Petty Officer Luttrell and, and many in the special ops community think, uh, say, well, how, how would that work out for you? You know, which of you was going to kill the 14-year-old shepherd? whose only crime and, uh, was herding sheep 
in his own near his own village in his own land um, how was that supposed to further your purposes and what was very clearly a poorly designed and deeply flawed mission to begin with uh, and you know raises sort of deeper questions that we have to ask ourselves before we readily say uh, yeah yeah just kill them all um, and also wonder what happens when you do things like that um, what are the challenges there and Murphy successfully negotiated those and I argue led his little contingent in very difficult circumstances to do the right thing and to try that they might they ended up paying a terrible price but it it suggests what both the importance and the difficulties are of maintaining a moral compass in such vexed circumstances. Another one that I think is really characteristic of how things are just not just changed, but convoluted in bizarre ways is in that chapter I mentioned called This Is Not Your Father's War, which began its life as an address to NATO on the 60th anniversary of the United Address to them. I was privileged to give, and I kind of let them have it because those are diplomats, you know, and folks with nice ties. I hope this is a nice tie, but um, anyway, they were the people who do all the, um, they were not the, the fighters in NATO, they were the bureaucrats in NATO, the diplomats in Brussels and so forth, coming together to celebrate their 60th anniversary. And I sort of said to them, do you guys actually know what it is your organization does? <laughs> do you know what we're asking them to do, for example, in Afghanistan? And I told the story off the bat of um, a woman who, if you Googled her name, her name is Paula Lloyd with one L, L-O-Y-D. If you Googled her name, you would see a picture of a very attractive young woman dressed in her camis uh, next to an Afghan villager uh, in, around uh, Kandahar, I think. And um, you would then find out that uh, she's deceased. And the interesting thing is, is not that she was a staff sergeant, uh, army, uh, lost her life in Afghanistan. Many, many tragically have done that. The thing was that she was not your conventional soldier. She was a staff sergeant. She was wearing uh, military uh, uh, combat fatigues. But she was, in fact, an anthropologist, a graduate of Wellesley, uh, had a master's degree, uh, and was there as part of what was then called, and uh, still called, the Human Terrain Team, working with a brigade uh, combat team and reconstruction team in that area, trying to dialogue with villagers and find out their needs and their practices and their customs and avoid giving offense and to try to do things that needed doing and so forth. And she, her death came as a result of her service in that capacity. She was not wearing, her head was not covered and she was doused with gasoline by a local villager and set a plane uh, and died several months later. Uh, we don't know why the villager did it, but we do know the customs. And uh, this is a surmise because he didn't live to tell the tale or her friends and, and uh, fellow uh, um, personnel. Um, killed him as soon as they found out what had happened to her, um, which was itself a, a separate problem. So the question is, well, what in the heck is this person, this social scientist, if you will, doing in a brigade combat team in this rather difficult situation to begin with, such that it would bring about her death and the death of several others who were doing what she was doing more or less the same time. Um, and so you tell the story of the development of the human terrain system and this woman being recruited for her expertise in uh, um, Central Asian cultures and languages and trained for four months at Fort Leavenworth and then deployed uh, uh, in, in a um, human terrain team uh, to work with soldiers and Marines uh, deployed in Afghanistan to help them with these cultural problems they were having. In a way, it was a brainchild of uh, then Deputy Marine Commandant uh, Jim Mattis, who said, you know, we need our soldiers, our sailors, our Marines, uh, 
to understand the human terrain very much as they understand the uh, geographical terrain in order to fight effectively and win this war. And that system was brilliantly set up by one of your fellow professors. I don't know if she's on the line with us this afternoon or not, but uh, Professor Montgomery McFate, who is there at the War College now, and is, I believe, the Athena professor, not sure exactly the title that she holds, um, uh, but over in the you know, strategic studies area of campus, uh, across from Spruins Hall, and she was really essentially, if you look at the history of this program begun in the mid uh, 2000s, the aughts, she was the, uh, the founding director and organizer of this and the chief proponent. So if you wanna find out, see if you could find Professor McFate, Mitzi McFate, and talk to her about the human terrain teams and the effect they had on uh, the conduct of the war uh, in Afghanistan. But this woman lost her life doing this and is memorialized at, or at least at what was their training center in Fort Leavenworth. And I just, you know, it's like, what the heck? You know, you're, you're gonna get people like me, um, younger versions, of course, stick them in a uniform, give them four months of training and send them off to a combat zone. Um, is this a good idea? Does it work? Uh, Professor McFate would have you know, much to say about that and has uh, recently edited a book that deals with the sort of impact and significance of the human train system. Um, but uh, this certainly is not anything that Carl von Clausewitz would have envisioned or planned for or would have taught because a lot of what the HTS teams did is, you know, morally motivated, if not morally focused. Um, on the well-being of the people, of the locals whom we're sent to serve and protect as part of the military mission. And the success or failure of those moral components of the mission is in turn central to the success or failure of the military mission and its political goals as well, is my point in this chapter. And there are various other examples of this wholly unconventional kind of thing that's been going on all around us for the last few years, transforming the way we think about and fight war. Many of you listening uh, here who are now students at the Naval War College, if you had were on the ground in Afghanistan or Iraq over the last, any time over the last decade, and many of you would, would have had that experience, you probably ran into these folks and wondered, I don't know what you thought of them, good or bad, or wondered who they were, or what they were doing there, or that you found them helpful. But there you go. I think that another thing is military contractors. Um, when I got to the Naval Academy in the 1990s, we were deeply in the midst of fighting wars of humanitarian um, intervention uh, in uh, Somalia and Haiti uh, and failing to do so in Rwanda and so forth. And those famous, the wars of the 1990s were largely humanitarian interventions or the failure to intervene militarily. Um, and when the military personnel got to the war theaters, they'd find that there were you know, more contractors in the battlefield than there were uh, military personnel. And that some militaries from, you know, especially from uh, underdeveloped countries were using their own militaries as contractors and le leasing them out to others uh, to help pay the salaries of, and the um, costs of having and developing and equipping a military. So it was a very convoluted and, and crazy kind of uh, situation. Uh, and yet there was no preparation in our military education at the Naval Academy. And later I learned there's none at NDU. There was no, I think there was one course at the National Defense University at the time. Um, and uh, none at the postgraduate school or at West Point or anything about military contracting. And yet it was one of the main features of war in the 1990s and certainly a huge feature during uh, the first Gulf War uh, and continues you know, to this day to be a feature of warfare. How can we be sending people in uniform working for the, you know, as public servants over into the uh, field of combat and have them not know how, who these people are, how to interact with them, 
course, now they do. I mean, this has become famous over the years. But at the time I started uh, working at the Naval Academy, there was nothing of this in the curriculum. And so that turns to another topic I take up in, in the book, that if, um, if this transformation of warfare is occurring, all these weird things and all these sort of moral um, features to political goals and to um, military combat, um, what are we doing to educate our men and women in uniform and prepare them for this? And if the answer is, well, not a damn thing, which it was in the um, 1990s and early 2000s, hardly a damn thing for this feature, these conventional postmodern, if you will, features of warfare. We're sending them out ill-prepared and that the preparation of men and women to fight these complicated wars is as important a mission as their training to handle firearms, to um, endure physical hardships, uh, to successfully pilot aircraft or to uh, pilot drones, uh, unmanned, uh, uninhabited aerial vehicles, et cetera. We, put all, we give them all these other skills and capacities. We need to give them the human terrain system business taught us. We need to give them capacities for intercultural awareness and communication. And we need to give them capacities for moral reasoning. And we need to acquaint them for how those things are gonna be applied uh, in the field of conflict when they're deployed. And they need to do it before they get there and not wait for them as often as pointed out, if, you know, if we, if we make ethics part of the center of, of conflict and I have to stand there wondering what the moral thing is to do, I'm gonna get shot. Um, so you don't, you don't wait till you get there any more than you wait to learn how to fire a rifle uh, or operate a cannon uh, or fly a plane until you're actually <laughs> in the cockpit or, or in um, on deployment. You don't wait till then, you do it now. What are we doing? Answer, not much, and it isn't very good. So that called for a whole new concept of military professional education, including ethics education and leadership training that would equip people to be more um, uh, able to reason in the battlefield like Lieutenant Murphy did, but not do it by accident, not do it on chance but be systematically prepared just like anything else in our military training to handle this uh, in advance, case studies, practices, laboratories, reading, reflection, discussion, argument. Um, these things needed to be part of our education and not just rote learning of military history and uh, international relations and engineering, which is the kind of stuff we were doing. And, talking about old wars like World War II and, uh, and uh, Korea. So from Vietnam to the present, all this transformation has been going on and, and we are constantly behind the power curve, I argued, in getting ready for it. That responsibility for the rest of us, you know, that this was my point to the NATO folks as well, that, you know, if, if we're asking all of you to do these kinds of difficult, complicated things for us, we need to have done much better job than we do for you to get you ready. Uh, and we're not doing it and shame on us. That new field of uh, endeavor, we gave the name, a name taken from classical just war theory, which I wanna say a few words about in conclusion. Um, and um, We talk about use ad bellum, the justification for going to war, use in bello, all the stuff about how we conduct ourselves, uh, our troops in the field, um, law of war and so forth. There was, had been much fuss over use post bellum in recent years over reconstruction and reparation and uh, rebuilding, which is what, again, the human train teams were helping our brigade reconstruction teams do in Afghanistan. Um, this new area of military education was, well, now everybody's got to be ready before they go, not after they get there and have to learn on the job, so to speak. They need at least to be prepared to be shocked and to be challenged. 
and the importance of making the right decisions and the impact of making the wrong ones in the form of moral injury and post-traumatic stress and the kinds of things that happen to people who make terrible mistakes or fail to realize the gravity of situations they're in. And what is that called? Well, use ante bellum would be the Latin uh, idiom for that, the preparation before going to war, uh, prior to war. Uh, and of course, we've always done this, and Clausewitz was running a military academy after all, but have we thought about that as a moral responsibility to not send our combatants into conflict without having adequately prepared them, not just with the mechanics and nuts and bolts of using weapons and um, dispensing deadly force, but also what happens to them, what challenges they'll face as human beings, uh, how they are to conduct and comport and think about themselves and each other, uh, the leadership that they should exert, officers to enlisted and so forth. Uh, all of this is a huge area that is kind of haphazard or was haphazard, and we need to think about more carefully. Okay, uh, maybe one more thing, um, and then let's wrap this up, uh, the, the, the lecture part. And that would be um, just war theory itself, uh, the kind of thing, by the way, that we used to not talk about until maybe somebody got a promotion to uh, uh, senior command and sent off to a war college. And then in the course of international relations, you'd study when nations go to war, what reasons they have that are better or worse than others, as well as what responsibilities uh, you have uh, as a commander. Um, for the behavior of your troops in the field. Um, we used to reserve that theoretical stuff, moral stuff, if you will, for the senior commanders, the, the few and the proud. Uh, but what about everybody else? And how important was it that the rank and file enlisted and young officers at military academies and ROTC units and so forth? Well, increasingly it's become important to say, well, even if they don't make the decisions to go to war, they need to know why the decisions are made the way they are. And they need to know what are the criteria by which those judgments are made. And I ought to be able to judge whether the war they're being asked to fight is, has fulfilled those criteria and be able to interpret that to the men and women under their command who are wondering, why are we here? What are we doing in a civil war in Vietnam? What are we doing helping Afghanis uh, against the Taliban? Why, you know, what business is this of ours? You need to be able to effectively interpret that to understand all of these, what were thought to be kind of high level, abstract theoretical considerations. They're not that at all. They're the nuts and bolts of basic moral and political reasoning about, um, conflict and how we handle it and what we think of adversaries and um, what we're willing and unwilling, permitted and not permitted to do in the pursuit of legitimate, otherwise legitimate military ends. So this is increasingly, you know, just war theory taught in um, undergraduate curricula as well. And to some extent in lesser ways to uh, enlisted personnel, that enlisted gap, if you will, in education is a huge area of concern, continues to be one for me and continue to work on it, providing and provide materials. You have the Army's Center for Professional, the Army Professional and Military Ethic, uh, um, CAPE, now moved from West Point out to uh, Fort Leavenworth. Um, an excellent initiative on the part of the Army. Uh, Navy has something similar at the War College. Uh, we're trying to think through how to reach everybody, not just the, pro the few and the proud who get promoted to 06 or from 05 to 06 and get sent to the war colleges uh, late in their careers. We want everybody in the professional uh, community who are practicing the profession of arms to know as much about these things and embody them in the work they do and the values that, to which they adhere uh, and the pride that they feel in the uniform and their uh, their mission as is possible. So um, that's just war theory. And uh, uh, there's some kind of abstract theoretical discussions in the book about uh, what that is, how it evolved, uh, and that they aren't the kind of 
portrayal that is often given that it's a, a unique kind of reflection. I try to relate this to the kind of reasoning that all of us do all the time about difficult moral decisions that are usually involve making exceptions to the rules that generally seem to hold for all of us. Um, when to kill, when thou shalt not kill, for example, or when to let die when you're supposed to say, or when to uh, lie when you're supposed to tell the truth, or when to blow the whistle uh, and turn and betray, as it were, a colleague or an institution if they're engaged in malfeasance. So when do we do these things? Well, only if there's a really, really compelling case, a situation whose moral gravity is so enormous that it overrides things like loyalty and truth telling and whatever it may be that you're making an exception of yourself for. So um, I try to show people how we all have experience in doing this. It isn't just diplomats and um, senior commanders and the Joint Chiefs of Staff and so forth, senior general officers. Um, it's all of us. We do this. And if we didn't know anything about it, we'd invent it for ourselves uh, in just this way, because these questions are fundamentally straightforward questions that we ask ourselves about any grave, uh, exceptional, serious moral decision we have to make. Do I have a good reason? Have I exhausted all the alternatives? Is there anything I haven't considered? Will the damage, whatever I'm about to do, be greater? than the damage that's being done that I'm trying to stop or avoid or whatever, and so on and so forth. Does it matter how I go about this? What are the means by which I should carry out my exceptional moral act? So I talk about that a bit and some concepts like uh, last resort that are uh, part of that tradition. But I end up finally saying uh, in the book, and I say anytime I get the chance, talking too much as I usually do, uh, but winding up by saying, look, um, what we want is to avoid what I call in the final chapter of the book, forgetful warriors. We want to take a page out of Plato's Republic, pages actually, uh, that many of you will have read when you were in high school or maybe college, and maybe didn't think that much of or understand all that well at the time, but look back at them with me at the very end of this discussion and think about what Socrates is trying to teach these young men around the table with him who would, after being taught, be soldiers in the Athenian army or in the future they're envisioning they would be guardians in a ideal state in which those people were chosen because of their character and their intellectual capacity and their devotion to duty. They loved the state more than themselves and would be willing to lay down their lives to protect it. We would need that. And we would need them not to forget who they were, not to turn on their fellow citizens, not to use their force against them or to betray them. Uh, uh, or endanger their lives. We would need them not to be forgetful in the sense that we use the word, uh, an English gentleman will use the term forgetfulness when he's remonstrating with someone who's lost their temper and has gone berserk and is you know, cursing and swearing and carrying on. Sir, you have forgotten yourself. Uh, and that's kind of stuffy. But there's a very important sense in which forgetting oneself is a very ser serious and grave problem. And analogically speaking, we forgot ourselves uh, during the lie and the massacre, uh, Lieutenant Kelly and his troops, as the person who stopped that massacre, Chief Warrant Officer Thompson, whom I discussed, said it. When asked later, why did you land your helicopter and, and point your rifle at your fellow soldiers who were killing civilians and me lie. What made you do that? He said, we'd forgotten who we are. We'd forgotten what we came there to do. And what Socrates tells his young charges, we need to have our soldiers, our guardians, remember who they are and what their mission is. They must not forget. 
Uh, so recollection and memory are, as they are themes in philosophy of Plato, are also themes in the military academy he envisioned and the military education he was giving to citizens of the Republic um, that would call forth the highest elements of their character, uh, their devotion, uh, and their performance of civic duty to the welfare of the, for the welfare of the state. Well, this is the sense in which ethics and military strategy have sort of gotten transformed in the, in the making and I think are to be thought of in a new way after Clausewitz. We don't throw out the old, but we keep it in a new frame of reference and a new context in which these kinds of considerations, including soldiers' memory um, and encouraging that through our military education policies become among the most important things that we do and that I'm proud to say my colleagues at the War College uh, who are kind enough to invite me and attend today are busy doing and that you all as students there are um, encouraging yourselves to do. So again, that's, I thank you for this chance to be with you and uh, look forward to any questions or comments you may have on this project or anything else. Thanks very much. <laughs>